welcome back to our course on construction grammar. Today we will look at construction of morphology. Remember that constructions are form and meaning pairings and that all levels of description involve form meaning pairs. The knowledge of language consequently is the network of these constructions and is known as the constructicon. Today we will take a first look at constructionist approaches to morphology. In particular, we will look at derivation, compounding and conversion. Just a quick revision. Remember the difference between rules and constructional schemas. Classically, things like untrue, unfriendly, unhappy, so not true, not friendly and not happy, were seen from a rule-based approach as an input-output phenomenon. The input is morphemes, un, attached to an adjective, and that gives you an output unadjective. Constructionist approaches, in particular usage-based ones, differ from this. They adopt a schema approach. So we are exposed to words like true, friendly and happy, and because of this create an abstract schema for adjectives in that they denote properties. Similarly, if you hear untrue, unfriendly and unhappy, you will be able to generalize to a schema that starts with un on the formal level, then has a slot for an adjective, and means not the property denoted by the adjective. The relationship between these two schemas is bidirectional, so not like the input-output error which only goes from input to output. And that helps us explain situations where we get a new instance that matches the unadjective construction, such as unguchi, and we can then correspondingly create Gucci as an adjective. So we can go from the output to the input as well in this approach. This works particularly well in situations where we don't seem to have an input. So attract, attraction, attractive, suggest, suggestion, suggestive, and prohibit, prohibition, prohibitive all seem to fit an input-output kind of approach but illusion and elusive exist, and they pattern with attraction, suggestion, prohibition, and attractive, suggestive, and prohibitive, um, but there is no verb, elusive. So instead of assuming that the verb is always the input for the noun and the adjective in these cases, we adopt a taxonomic approach that uses schemas. So there is one schema for attract and suggest, which is verbs ending in ter that denote actions, and that is linked to attraction and suggestion, which conceptualizes or construes these as things. Finally, there is a schema for the property, which ends in tiv. Traditionally, cases such as these are known as derivation. So you've got a morpheme un, iv, and shun that is bound because it always needs to attach to a free morpheme, and it's lexical because it creates new words. So whenever a bound and a free morpheme are combined, as in un and happy, this is called derivation. Now we've already seen that from a constructionist morphology perspective, this is actually not just a small little morpheme, but a partly fixed and schematic construction, un adjective, which is the meaning of not the property denoted by the adjective. Important for constructionist morphology is therefore type token frequency, the specific exemplars that instantiate a specific schema or help us um, get to a schema via type frequency, and the network structure of how an unadjective construction, for example, is linked to the adjective construction. Let's look at two more productive word formation processes of English and see how we can capture them with a constructionist approach. The second one is compounding. So steamboat consists of steam and boat, and both steam and boat are existing words, so they are called free morphemes. So in cases when you combine two free morphemes, this is known as compounding in traditional morphology. The most frequent type are endocentric compounds. So steamboat is a kind of boat, daylight is a kind of light, and armchair is a kind of chair. So the second part is always the semantic head. And the first part is only a modifier that modifies this head. When you look at the meaning of the compounds, however, you will see that there is no straightforward prediction as to what the modifier head structure is going to be. What do I mean by this? Well, a steamboat is a boat driven by steam. Daylight is light occurring during daytime. An armchair is a chair with armrests. 
So the specific relation between the two nouns is actually frame-based and you need to take into account encyclopedic knowledge. Abbreviating this, we could just say that N1 has a relation R with N2. Then for a specific compound, it's the frame-based encyclopedic knowledge that will tell us which relation that is. Using our constructional schemas and network representation, we therefore got two nouns. And these are linked to an endocentric noun-noun compound construction. On the phonology level, this compound construction has initial stress on the first element. Morphosyntactically, we know that it combines two nouns and itself is a noun. And semantically, we know that because these are endocentric compounds, the second part, which gets the number two, um, or B on the semantic level is the more important one. So daylight is a kind of light. It's a, a B is a kind of B. And this B has a relation to the first element, which on the meaning level we call A1. So a steamboat is a boat that's driven by steam. Finally, we sometimes get cases of conversion, where a free morpheme changes its work class and consequently its meaning. But there is no formal change, so to play can become a play. The process of conversion happens, for example, with nouns to verbs, and in English it's a quite frequent process. So a bottle can become to bottle someone, a bridge can become to bridge a gap, and a stage can become to stage a play. Again, the meaning is frame-based and encyclopedic in its interpretation, so it can have completely different meanings. So there isn't a single meaning that um, all these verbs have got in common that arise through conversion. But it's always the specific frame of the noun that um, tells us what the overall, what the meaning's going to be. So to bottle is to hit someone with a bottle, to bridge is cover a gap with a bridge, and to stage is to put on a play. The meaning therefore is activity with relation R to N. So our noun, when it becomes converted to a verb, is turned into an activity, but it still has a relation R, an encyclopedic frame-based one, to the noun from which it is converted. So here we've got um, an example of the noun to verb conversion construction. So we're going to have a horizontal link between the noun on the left-hand side, which denotes a thing, and a corresponding construction that has the same phonology but on the morphosyntactic level marks it as a verb, so it's going to be used in situations and constructions into which verbs can go. And on the semantic level, it now denotes an activity that has some kind of encyclopedic frame-based relationship with the thing denoted by the original noun. Note that noun-to-verb conversion is, of course, not the only type of conversion in English. You also have verb-to-noun, as in he coughed, he had a nasty cough, or to desire something, his desire. To doubt something can become they have doubts. Even a preposition can become a verb, as in to down a beer. So there will have to be more constructions that cover these types of conversion processes. Summing up our first look at constructionist morphology. Constructionist morphology is not rule-based, it is schema-based, or in other words, output-based. This calls into questions, of course, the definition of morphemes as the smallest units that carry meaning, because we don't really deal with morphemes anymore, but instead have schemas which are partly fixed and partly flexible. Still, as I hopefully will have been able to show you, a constructionist approach can perfectly capture all of the major word formation processes that are normally covered in morphology. Important throughout was our constructional network, the Constructicum. So far for today, as we will see in the next session, the the real big advantage of using constructionist morphology and the schema-based approach is when we look at non-morphological word formation processes. Because as we will see, in traditional approaches, these need to be explained by completely different approaches and accounts, whereas from a constructionist perspective, they follow exactly the schema-based approach that we've outlined for compounding, conversion and derivation. Thank you very much for your attention. See you next time.